Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Klein, the, the recently released five-year plan for offshore oil and gas leasing includes the fewest lease sales in history. And your department brags about that. They're very pleased with themselves. This is the headline, your, your department press release. Reflecting America's rapid and accelerating shift to clean energy, Interior Department announces fewest offshore oil and gas lease sales in history in proposal final program for uh, in proposed final program for 2024 to 2029. So that's that's your bragging and uh, your that's your position. It also suggests that you are holding those fewest sales solely, not for oil and gas, but for the purposes of enabling the offshore wind program to continue. That's what your release says. So in your view, is there any reason ever to hold offshore oil and gas lease sales? other than to ensure that the Bureau can hold offshore wind lease sales? Uh, well, thank you very much for the question, Senator. Uh, the proposed final program, obviously, is a decision by the Secretary based on the, what she believes to be the nation's energy needs in the next five years, based on a number of factors she's required to consider in OXLA. The Inflation Reduction Act gave us very clear direction about uh, the, you know, what how we link oil and gas lease sales to the offshore wind program, and we've proposed the minimum number of sales needed to continue to expand our offshore wind leasing program into the future. The president's made clear that climate change is a crisis that he believes the federal government has a responsibility to do something about, and the transition to clean energy is something that this administration is very focused on. So it sounds like you, as director of our nation's, our nation's offshore oil and gas program, actually doesn't think there should be any offshore oil and gas program. Ms. Ms. Klein, the Biden administration is now lifting sanctions on Venezuelan oil. This is the administration that you just talked about. Now, the oil produced in Venezuela ranks among the worst in the world in terms of carbon intensity, while production in the Gulf of Mexico is among the best. Is it better for the environment for oil to be produced in the Gulf of Mexico or in Venezuela? Well, thank you for that question. I think our, the documents and the analytical documents contained as part of the proposed final program go into some detail about the emissions associated with Gulf of Mexico oil development. We walk through that and we, and we agree that the analysis shows that the emissions are lower for upstream production associated with Gulf of Mexico oil and gas resources. When you consider the full life cycle emissions of upstream and downstream production, the numbers are, are different. Um, and you know the proposed final program from the Secretary's perspective meets the energy needs for the next five years. So oil from Iran, oil from Russia, also ranked near the bottom in terms of carbon intensity. I mean, you're summa cum laude from college, summa cum laude from law school. This is a simple question. Is it better for the environment for oil production if it occurs in the Gulf of Mexico or Iran and Russia and Venezuela? Which is what the president is asking for and allowing. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I think a lot of the feedback we received is that it might be better for the environment if we transition to clean energy sources. So you're refusing to answer the if or or, but what you're saying, the president's decision to go to Iran, to go to Venezuela, to go to Russia is okay and better because you're shutting it down in the Gulf of Mexico, so we just don't have it here. So the administration's efforts to choke off new oil and gas lease sales on federal lands and waters, they're bad for our national economic security. They're bad for the um, environment. These anti-American energy policies are more than misguided. They are shameful, and you're smart enough to know that. Ms. Coit, last month, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management attempted to impose major travel restrictions on ships servicing oil, oil and gas operations in the central and western Gulf of Mexico in order to protect Rice's whales. I would note that ships servicing oil and gas operations make up less than 10% of the total ship traffic in the Gulf. That means 90% of the ship traffic, nothing to do with oil and gas production. Can whales tell the difference between the ships servicing oil and gas operations and other ships? Turn your, turn your mic on, ma'am. Uh, thank you again for that question. Uh, the uh, endangered rice's whale, one of the threats to that whale um, is from ship 
strikes, vessel strikes, um, and the opportunity for us to mitigate those impacts um, occurs when we consult with other federal agencies. Uh, so um, we're trying to reduce threats to the unendangered whale as required under the Endangered Species Act. But you didn't answer the question. Is there any rational basis for imposing restrictions on the ships that service the oil and gas operations, but not on the other 90 percent of the ships that travel in the same area? I believe the rational basis is that under the Endangered Species Act, we're dealing with federal agency actions, and most of those other fish, uh, excuse me, other ships are not um, going to be uh, something that's approved by the federal Department of the Interior. It's not, a, it's not then a rational decision. You feel you're mandated by law to do that, but it's not because those 90 percent of the ships that are still allowed to go are safer ships than the other 10 percent that are the oil and gas ships. Okay. So th this chart shows all of the confirmed suspected sightings of the Rice's whale um, last 20 years. The black dots are confirmed sightings. Most of them are over there where we see the Florida coast and under Alabama. Uh, there's this one dot way over here uh, by Texas. An enormous gap between the sighting and the whale's known habitat off the coast of Florida. We know they're over there. We know that and understand that. Is it your position that activities in areas where there have been no confirmed sightings at all, they need to be restricted to in order to protect the rice as well? The, the, western, uh, the western Gulf has uh, just a few sightings, as you state. It also had, we have a record of passive. Well, there was one sighting and it was six years ago. Yeah. Well, we've actually um, believe we've seen a bunch this last summer okay. as well. And we have passive acoustic monitoring um, that demonstrates that there are rice's whales there. They have a distinctive call and they are there 12 months of the year in the Western Gulf. Um, so we're confident from the latest and best available science that they are in the Western Gulf. So do we need to block off all this area in between? I just want to, want to cl clarify. It looks like your um, map has, is uh, related to our proposed critical habitat, and that is not blocking off the area. It's uh, simply identifying habitat that's important for their feeding and survival. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm, my time has expired. Thank you. Senator Heiner. 